Welcome to Crawl Space. This is episode one of our look into the disappearance of Brianna Maitland. I'm Tim. I'm here with Lance and our new friend Chloe. How's it going, Chloe? I'm doing well. How are you guys doing this evening? We are doing very well. Well, speaking for myself, I'm doing very well. Don't speak for me. I would never speak for you. We are talking about the Brianna Maitland case, and we first want to go over a couple of details about her physically. She was born October 8th, 1986. She went missing March 19th, 2004. She was 17 years old. She's 5'4", 105 pounds. And her parents are Bruce and Kelly Maitland. She went missing in Montgomery, Vermont. Montgomery, Vermont uh, was where she was working at the Black Lantern Inn. And um, her car was found in Rich Richford, correct? Richford, Vermont. It was about a mile and a half away from the restaurant. We got into this case because of our other podcast, Missing Maura Murray. Some people think Maura Murray and Brianna Maitland's disappearances are connected. We took a quick peek into that, and we did two episodes covering Brianna's case on our other podcast, Missing Maura Murray. It's kind of impossible to look into Maura's case and not have Brianna's case come up. And it became apparent to us that it's sort of our responsibility now to look into Brianna's case with everything that's happened in Morris' case. Yes, a lot of those out there, a lot of the listeners and a, and a lot of the uh, amateur detectives look at the, and professional detectives too, look at Brianna's case and, and Morris' case and they put them together because they are close in proximity and close in, in time. Uh, proximity, I believe, it was around 100 miles, so about an hour and a half or so drive between the two locations. We say that, but that's also kind of irresponsible to say that, too. If I'm rambling, just stop me. It's also a little irresponsible to say that because um, they were a month apart. I mean, saying that it's about an hour and a half drive from it, I personally don't think that that has anything to do with it It, because it happened about a month later. But anyway, inevitably, you look at the two cases. We also got into this because of the people that we met surrounding the Brianna Maitland case. Uh, one guy, Tarek, we've been very friendly with on the Facebook page for the Maura Murray case. So we had said to him that we want to do an episode on Brianna Maitland months ago. And so that kind of kind of finally came to fruition, but not after we heard from private investigator Greg Overacker, who messaged us on Facebook as well, asking for information on John Smith. He wanted John Smith's contact information. We said, hey, you know, we're thinking about doing an episode or two on Brianna Maitland. Would you like to participate? He said yes. And so with those two people and Mark Harper from MJA, we had three people who were directly connected to this case or had worked on it in, on some professional level. With this podcast, we're also bringing Chloe Cantor on. So Chloe, let's hear a little bit about you and your background. I primarily work as a psychiatric counselor in an inpatient psychiatric unit in Massachusetts, and I've been researching and investigating missing persons cases independently for many years now, and I recently started working with you two and with John, um, and that's been for several months. My degree is in psychology and in criminal justice, and I've been interested in missing persons cases and cold cases since early high school. I think that my interest in mental health and true crime have intersected in a way that I have become very interested in analyzing the mindset of missing people and doing research to potentially uncover new leads. And good for you because that is that is really, really fascinating stuff. The mindset of the people out there, the perpetrators, the people looking into these cases and where's the line, you know? So good for you and, and welcome aboard. Thanks for helping us out with everything. Absolutely. Yes, welcome aboard. And uh, who who did you look into uh, cases with before you met uh, met us? I have an identical twin sister, Melina, with whom I'm very close. And starting at around middle school, we realized that we had this same sense of morbid curiosity about the darker side of humanity and an interest in odd human phenomena. So starting at around then, we were looking at Charlie Project and at the FBI's website and their missing persons page. And this has continued to now. Now we're both adults and we both have our psychology degrees. So it's been really great to collaborate and bounce ideas off of each other. We're, we're pretty sure this is Chloe talking to us and not her twin sister. But, and we're fully anticipating that games will be played to uh, mess with our heads. Wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> so for 
the people like Lance and I who don't spend a lot of time inside hospitals, what Speak exactly do you do <laughs> on a day-to-day -day basis uh, with your job? What I like about it is that my responsibilities are quite variable, so the day is always interesting. So um, in any given shift, I'll be facilitating group therapy, one-on-one -on -one counseling, um, performing checks and taking vitals, and um, a lot of it's paperwork, but a lot of it is um, clinical work with patients. Do you think your time leading group therapy is going to help uh, with Lance and I's petty arguments? If I can be productive in that way, that would be fantastic. <laughs> That's actually why you're here. Oh, good, good. <laughs> the truth comes just, out. It was getting to Tim. <laughs> we also want to mention that we spoke with Bruce Maitland, Brianna's dad, uh, a couple weeks ago, and he is going to do an interview with us. So that is pretty exciting for us to have that kind of open relationship with the Maitland family. We are working on some other interviews. Um, we probably shouldn't mention them yet until they're confirmed, but we did put out a, a, quite a bit of information on the first two episodes that we did on this. And we're going to air each and every one of those interviews that we conducted in their entirety on this channel. So if you want all the information that we have up to this point, listen to all those interviews. This episode sort of serves the purpose of us having digested that information and coming together to talk about it. Now, you know, you know, I'm a fan of metaphors and I they help me to wrap logic around certain things and taking on Brianna's case. Uh, those two episodes that we did on uh, the more Murray channel um, really helped me to think about it like a forward to to the to the book that is Brianna Maitland's case. So we do the forward and then we, then we process like like you said Tim we process the information and we're also processing uh, the fact that you you said uh, Bruce Maitland Brianna's dad is going to be speaking with us about the about his daughter and about the case. Um, he he reached out to us and Greg Overacker reached out to us and Mark Harper reached out to us and and Tarek reached out to us. So what I'm saying is I'm trying to process people wanting to talk to us as opposed to us struggling to get people to talk. It's been a different experience so far yeah. than with Missing More Murray, no doubt about that. Speaking of, if you want to talk to us, please email us at crawlspacepodcast at gmail.com and follow us on Twitter at crawlspacepod. We're also on Instagram and Facebook. So let's get into the information that we've already heard from Tarek, from Mark, and from Greg, and let's talk about that. Let's talk about what the most interesting things that we've found personally are. Right. Let's let's start digging and and a word of warning, like we did with uh, Morris case. It's very dense. It's got a lot of information. It's going to be a lot of characters again, and take it all responsibly. You know, started partying like most teenagers do. It's no big deal. And she was going to high school at the also at the same time. Uh, she was going to uh, she went to a high school uh, called uh, the Mississauga Valley Union High School, which is in Swanton and Highgate Springs. And then uh, she ended up moving to a high school in uh, Innisburg Falls uh, at the end of her sophomore year. And then uh, that's when things started to move around a lot. There was a lot of movement basically before she went missing. She started working uh, two jobs, uh, or actually she started one job. She was supposed to start a second job, uh, uh, actually a few days after she went missing. She got a job as a dishwasher at the Black Lantern Inn in uh, Montgomery in Vermont. Uh, and she was working there uh, full time because she had just gotten her G GHD and she wanted to start college part time and work because she had to, you know, she was alone. She she was living, you know, from one place to another, like living with a few friends, living with, you know, a couple of boyfriends and things like that. And she wanted to really be independent, but she also needed the money. So she had, she was kind of like juggling between two jobs and wanting to uh, make something out of her life. A lot of things changed in the few weeks before she went missing. You know, she was assaulted at a party. And uh, she was also, as time went on, I, I, this is pure speculation, but I believe that she was trying to get her life back on track 
and that as she was trying to get her life back on track, she was moving away from that that group of people uh, that ultimately were involved in her disappearance. But I think that uh, what happened basically is that on the night of March 19, 2004, uh, she finished her shift as a dishwasher uh, at the Black Lantern Inn around 11, 12, 11.30. You know, the next day, they found her car where they found it. They found it and there was no trace of her. So, Chloe, you've been working with us on, on Brianna's case for several weeks now, maybe even a few months. Um, what is it that stand, What is it that stood out to you right away when we brought you into this? I would say what initially drew me in the most was um, were the new discoveries by MJA Investigations. I didn't know that um, there was vomit on her door jam, for instance. I didn't know about the additional fingerprints that were uncovered. All of that was new information, and... I look at new information with a grain of salt, but that was, to me, it was sort of a, it, it was unprecedented in the amount of information that was released in terms of the state of her car. I wonder how new that information is to most of the community. Uh, I, I didn't know that that information. Uh, we haven't asked Greg Overacker yet if, if he was aware of it, um, but it is interesting. Um, I mean, I, I feel like I've been following Brianna's case for years now, and that was the first I've heard of any of that. MJA collected evidence that we believe was missed by the Vermont State Police. MJA found four fingerprints that hadn't been collected. The Vermont State Police left behind in the vehicle some of their fingerprint tapes that looked to have readable prints on them. The four prints that we collected, it's a 70 to 30 chance that they are readable. Then also with the light source, found new traces of blood under the driver door armrest. See no evidence that the Vermont State Police took samples from these traces were so small that they would have collected them all. Three green fibers. When fibers are separated, you are to collect all of them. One light blue syringe cap missed by the Vermont State Police on May 15th and 16th, 2004. NJA found it and collected evidence that pointed that was related to the Maitland case. Items found. Victoria's Secret's underwear that matches Miss Maitland's size and style. Three sets of flex club cups that had been cut off and there were traces of hair in the locking area of the cups. One syringe that happens to match the light blue syringe cap that, collect, that was collected from Miss Maitland's vehicle. MJA turned over those items to the Vermont State Police at the St. Albans Barracks on May 16, 2004. For anybody out there that's not aware of this, her car was found backed into an old boarded up house, a barn, a barn type house, right? Uh, the old Dutch burn barn, which has since burned down, but has been there for a long, long time and was a, was, was sort of a place where I, I guess I would call it a squatter's house, right? So her car is backed into this, into very awkwardly backed into it. If you look at the pictures online, it's very, very spooky stuff. Uh, looks very spooky. It looks very desolate. I know there's a couple other um, barns in the area. You've been up there, right, Chloe? Yeah, um, there, there were many dilapidated roadside barns that I encountered, very isolated. Now, while it is surprising that they didn't discover the vomit, or maybe they did and they just didn't record it. Uh, we'll have to find out about that. But it sounds like, well, it is. This is another case of very small town, uh, New England, police force not properly investigating a case in an, in an expeditious fashion. And I know that they don't know what the outcome will ultimately be. They don't, they see an abandoned car. It's just unfortunate they see an un- abandoned car and think, 
someone was drinking and driving and, and will come back to their car later on. How many times does something like this have to happen? Um, we'll, we'll get more into the details on, on the discovery of whose car it was and how long it took. I mean, we can talk about it now if you want. How long? This is what fires me up, up about this case, how the parents randomly found out just – a, a police officer. Well, they went. Yeah, they went yeah, they down went there the because yeah, they hadn't station. seen their daughter, mm-hmm. and someone just random another officer randomly overheard them asking about it, and he shows a picture of the car. Is this your? Is this the car? And Kelly Maitland said that she saw evil in that picture. That's the direct quote. Look at the picture. Yeah, that is. I mean, even without the car in the in the. In the picture, if you just find the pictures of the of the barn, I did this uh, the other night, just looking at pictures of that barn alone. That's just a creepy fucking place. Her exact quote was, my stomach rolled. I started to shake. I saw evil in the picture. If you look at that picture, it's really hard to disagree with her. Where did she um, where did she say that? Is that a is that a, a newspaper quote? Yeah, it's from NBC News. The eeriness of the scene begs the question, why did law enforcement lay eyes upon that scene and think that everything was going to be okay, that it was just a drunk driver that would return the next day unharmed. People crash all the time and run into the woods or abandon their car, but it didn't look like that to me. The crash itself looked unnatural, and the Oldsmobile had been backed into that barn very forcefully by appearances. And awkwardly. Yes. It it wasn't an everyday crash. No. It wasn't like, oh, car spun out of the road and backed itself into this house. No. Um, not only the police, her boyfriend drove by that car. Ex-boyfriend. I'm sorry, ex-boyfriend. Drove by after a night in Canada, apparently drinking. He claimed he was drunk, but didn't, didn't follow up on it. He knew it was her car. Just very strange circumstances. What The area itself, it's, it's again that area that's got that isolationist, feel to it and we'll get that you know those people they don't want you know it's not if it's not their business they don't pay attention to it including a car backed into a barn when it's your ex-girlfriend and she's not around and no one knows where she is for like how long a week because brianna's roommate was out of town at her grandmother's over that weekend and several other factors it took several days for everyone to be on the same page that brianna was not accounted for and was missing. So the official police report that she was missing was filed on March 23rd. And she went missing on the 19th, so that's four days. Four days. And we have the skiing group, right? That that was the first one that actually brought attention to the car. They took the pictures that you'll find online that we probably use uh, as our thumbnails. group of guys they called themselves the world travelers and they were leaving jay's peak which is close you can actually see jay's peak from there i believe but they were driving by and that's that's another thing that really got bruce and kelly upset was that police officer stops and looks at it and says oh it was a drunk driver or something and just moves on to the next thing kind of goes on his long weekend or whatever and here these got young guys stop and think it's so odd that they stop and take pictures They just thought it was bizarre. So, and that's the reason that the family and the public really had pictures. I mean, the, the, the police officer did snap some pictures while he was there. Um, and you know, I never talked to him and I don't know, maybe his, his side of the story is a little different than what I'm, what I'm saying, but it seemed bizarre that he would leave and just move on to something else. I, in my mind, I'd be thinking what happened here? I mean, this wasn't like somebody slid off the road and went in a ditch. It was purposely backed off the road and the Dutch burn house sat I don't they measured it that was going you're going back 2006 but I couldn't tell you how many feet but it's a little ways I mean they, she would have had to get that car moving in reverse pretty good and to hit that house one thing I wanted to talk about is the moment when Brianna was shopping with her mom, Kelly, earlier that day. And we heard from Greg Overacker, who told us that he spoke with someone who told him exactly what Brianna heard that day. And then it was for her to not go to work that night. 
Um, it was some kind of warning to Brianna is what we heard. And obviously there is more that we, we haven't heard at this point. But this is what Tarek was alluding to when he said he believes immaturity, uh, so to speak, is what got Brianna in trouble here because she didn't take this threat seriously enough. But uh, I found a witness who told me who it was and what was said. Again, I don't think that that's something I should go into without at least first talking to Bruce about it. But Was it a face-to-face -face encounter or was it a, um, a phone call? It was face-to-face, -face and I can tell you that the, 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 what I was told by this witness was that uh, she was told not to go to work that night. That particular witness, uh, the police spoke to him, the other people spoke to him. I, I kind of have some confidence in this guy, and I, I don't know if the police don't. I don't think that they interviewed him as well as I think they should have. I kind of have a problem with that. But This is a witness to whatever happened outside of the store in the parking lot. Yeah, he actually didn't. He wasn't an eyewitness. He said that the person who spoke to her told him himself, hey, this is what I told her not to go to work that night. Anybody knows anything about that moment, if you're the person that talked to Brianna, reach out to us. I mean, anybody who knows anything about that moment, it could be it could be one of those, you know, this doesn't matter moments, right? You know, it's just one right. of those. Uh, doesn't sound like it. Doesn't sound like it, does it? At this time, when you hear about a, what is potentially a very tense, agitating confrontation between the missing person and an unknown person on the day that person goes missing, it, it seems pretty important. It sounds like he, he she was given a warning right, um, to not go to work, and she did because she didn't take it very seriously or seriously enough. But she took it seriously enough where her mother has since described her reaction to it. She she was a bit shaken up by that, according to her mother. Uh, right. That happened that happened the morning of, right? Yeah, they um, that morning she took her GED exam, and then they went shopping. And at the end of that shopping trip, while they were checking out, I believe, is when the confrontation happened. And then um, after which, um, Kelly described Brianna as being agitated and um, sort of rushing to go and not really wanting to discuss what had happened, just kind of saying, I got to get to work, got to get to work. So her mood changed. Yeah, her, her whole mood and affect. Obviously, if she heard, don't go to work because, you know, you might get hurt there or something might happen to you because of that if you go to work. Right. So do we all agree that the circumstances that morning, there's a high probability that this is what led to where her car was found backed into the Dutch burn barn? Yes. Normally, I would point out that it's a logical fallacy to assume that two events that occur together have a cause and effect relationship. But in an instance such as this one where a woman goes missing and hasn't been found for 13 years, the likelihood that something that happened on the day she went missing is relevant increases, particularly when we think that it was threatening in nature. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think there's a high probability it was related to Brianna going missing. But I do want to mention that two out of the three interviews that we conducted so far have sort of concluded as such, as, as that being part of the disappearance. However, one of the interviews we conducted doesn't necessarily believe that because uh, that person believes something different entirely. Right. So Mark Harper with MJA is currently investigating a serial killer in the area whose calling card is to leave no evidence. That's that's his theory. That's something that he told us on on um, when we interviewed him on uh, Missing More Murray episode thirty two. We'll link to it in the show notes. So uh, having a having a public confrontation would be out of the realm of um, this theoretical person's mo because they wouldn't want to leave evidence behind. Definitely. So I don't know where else to go with that. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to know more about what informs. What informs that theory? Because okay. if, because if, okay. I mean, if we're working around it, it, then like... Let's get into it, yeah. Let's get into it a little bit because I have some thoughts. Um, I had texted Lance some of, the, some of my thoughts about this, and I don't think it should be discounted. Although I will say 
Um, it, it, it seems like from what we've heard, all the information we've heard, it doesn't seem like these two cases are connected. It doesn't seem like this is a likely case of a serial killer, but there are some crazy details about this case that makes you think it could be. The syringe that was found in the car and that Mark Harper said he found a, a cap also and he believed that that was a hot shot and he he didn't have results from the vermont state police on it so we don't know if that was like a a shot of heroin to subdue brianna which goes directly against mark's theory that this is a serial killer whose calling card is to leave no calling card that was exactly what i was going to say because he left the syringe cap behind and there was zip ties with hair with her hair in it up the road buried the syringe and what Mark said was women's underwear that fit Brianna's size and description. A little bit up the hill, and Mark Harper coincidentally found that. Now, feel however you may about Mark Harper, I I don't know. I'm just saying he turned that in as evidence. The syringe that he found matched the syringe cap that was found in the car. So, and he said, he theorized that, well, killers, they always go back to the scene. So that would kind of fit that profile. Killers don't always go back to the scene. Israeli Keys didn't go back to his scenes. He was incredibly detailed. MOs are so variant between offenders that I think it's irresponsible to make a blanket statement that all killers do the same thing because it's just not true. Right. No, I agree. I agree. It's not necessarily uh, the case. But um, I just I don't think the serial killer thing should be completely discounted. Let's let's talk about the lime real quick. And this is really actually, uh, I should have led with this because this is probably the strongest uh, evidence that, that it, something effed up happened that night. There was a lime wedge found on Brianna's trunk. And as we know, the car smashed into the house pretty good, so much that it knocked the foundation and, and it got the car stuck into the house. But yet there was a lime wedge found on the trunk, on top of the trunk. And it was frozen to the trunk, right? It, so it might have been there for a little while. We we don't know. Um, I did listen to the Vanished podcast and uh, the wonderful host over there. I talked with her, Marissa Jones. She seemed to think, well, Brianna worked at a bar. Maybe uh, the lime was just from a drink and someone tossed it as they were walking out, landed there and froze to her trunk. And I think that's pretty reasonable. But I will say that if a lime wedge has been dunked in alcohol, its freezing point would be uh, different than it would if it was water. Right. If it was just dunked in straight water. So it would be have to be colder than 32 degrees right off the bat to be frozen stuck. And, right. and how long would it take to be frozen completely to that trunk where it wouldn't leave the trunk? It wouldn't slide off if you're driving a mile and a half down the road or slamming into a house. Right. Here's my two cents on it. I was very... Uh... First time I heard of this, I don't know if you remember, I was like, this this could be something. This could be... And I just get that way, I guess. I get, like, excited about one thing, but then you got to reel back a little bit and just look at the reality of everything. I worked at a restaurant, too. It didn't have to be a lime that was coming from something with alcohol in it. It could have been a lime coming from a, a tonic water. Uh, it it could have been a lime in, in any drink that – or it could have been a lime on the side of a, a – you know, a garnish on the side of a, of a dish. And s- someone's taken the trash out, and they whip the trash over into the dumpster, and the, li- you know, lime comes out, whatever. It sticks on the car. I've I worked in a restaurant. There was crazy shit that I would find, you know, in in my car or on my car. Um, what are you talking about? You'd find crazy shit in your car, or on your car. <laughs> I would put shit in my pockets, for instance, um, in like an apron pocket. Okay, so just that bartending. was you leaving crazy shit in your car. No, no, I would, I would this, find this, uh, this find lime stuff. isn't Brianna leaving a lime on her trunk. It could have been somebody um, walking out of the restaurant and just, you know, whipping the lime, like. It also could have it could have a massive amount of sugar on it from whatever drink it's in. So it could be frozen. It could be stuck with sugar. I know it provoked discussion that maybe people were hanging out and drinking, like at the old Dutch Burn Barn, like during her disappearance. But I mean, in what world would you leave a bar with the lime on your drink still? I mean, leave the bar with a drink at all, but especially all intact with the lime. Yeah. 
talk about a, a calling card that that's like a casual drinker that would yeah. be a casual drinker's calling card if if like someone just showed up at the random park or the random spot that you drink outside at with a gin and tonic with a lime wedge in it right the, the, and the, uh, the gimlet murderer <laughs> Right, and who's going to be drinking outside? I, I don't know. At that time of night, and it's cold out. I feel like people are going outside if they're smoking. I'm drinking from like a, a like a like a a liter of something. You know, I'm not I'm not rimming my glass with <laughs> rimming my glass with a lime juice and squeezing it in and putting sugar on it. You know, I th- I think it's if anyone has any other uh, thoughts on it, I'm I'm. I would love to hear them, but I think it might be something that is just barking up the wrong tree. Yeah. I mean, too, I definitely don't think it's uh, like a sign or a symbol. I don't think it's anything like that. The only thing that kills me, though, is that the car was backed into the house. And we just need to know where that line was on the car. Because the car was backed into the house and the, it, it wasn't like the trunk wasn't totally in the house. It was part of the trunk. It could have been on the other side. Um, and that, that, that house was beat up too. I mean, it didn't really, I can't imagine it took much pressure for, for the, for the boat of a car that she was driving to, 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 you know, penetrate to, 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 to get into that, you know, to, to break through that, the, the window area and the foundation of the house. Yeah, absolutely. Those cars back then were built like tanks. I definitely agree with Overacker in terms of how he thinks the crash happened, the circumstances, and that she was trying to get away and accidentally or on purpose went in reverse and just went straight back too hard when she was just trying to go around. And this car she's driving, it's a 1985 Oldsmobile sedan. It was the 88 Royale. So the area to me is really fascinating because we covered the, the we covered Maura Murray's case. Now we're looking at this and that area up there. And I've said it before in in with Maura's case that I just get the like the area is a character to me. Um, you've been doing a lot of looking into the to the area, right, Chloe? Absolutely. And I've been to the Montgomery area as well as the Woodsville area um, where Maura Murray disappeared. And both of them have very similar vibes of just being very desolate, just a different kind of culture. Woodsville is more mountainous, while Montgomery is very agricultural, farmland, um, and just agricultural oriented. The whole economy is centered mostly around agriculture and tourism um, in nearby Jay's Peak. And I'm sorry for being not familiar. Jay's Peak is a, a ski resort? Yes. Um, yeah, it's a ski mountain resort. Um, Pretty close? A couple miles. Yeah, in the, in this, um, in the town of Jay nearby. Gotcha. Is there a lot of crime there? What's the what's the story with the crime? I know that there's uh, heavy drug use or was heavy drug use at the time. The Uniform Crime Report from the years 2003 and 2004 reported that the state of Vermont had a violent crime rate of 112 per 100,000 people. That's compared to the United States rate, which is 465, and New England, which is 395 per 100,000 people. So comparatively speaking, the state had a lower crime rate than its counterparts. Also important to note, um, in 2004, Franklin County as a whole had a total of 19 violent offenses that were known to law enforcement, none of which were murder. Vermont alone had 16 total murders that were known to law enforcement, and Franklin County itself only had 13 police officers. Jesus. Yeah, right? Franklin County had no murders in 2004. At least um, no murders that were known to law enforcement. Wow, that's impressive. I would love to talk to some of the law enforcement, some of the police officers that were there in 2004. Speaking of violent crimes, we wanted to play a clip that we left out of the Greg Overacker interview from our episode that we aired with him on Missing Maura Murray. So his interview will be played on this channel in its entirety, but we want to play this clip. Ramon Ryans and Nathaniel Jackson were 
two guys that were in Vermont, and their sole purpose for being there, they didn't have any relatives there, they didn't have any friends there. The sole purpose for being there was they sold drugs, they sold crack. The crack epidemic going on at the time. After Brianna's disappearance, an anonymous call came in and said, Brianna's being held in the root cellar of this home on Reservoir Road. So, uh, some fish and game uh, police officers uh, went up there and approached the house. Initially, Bruce called them and said, <laughs> you know, if you don't go, I'm going. I'll get some friends and we'll go right now. And they said, no, 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 we'll do it. And they did. Uh, they got everybody out front and center and asked about it. And they said, we don't know what you're talking about. And they said, can we come in and look around? And they said, yes. Uh, so the officers went in and searched the house in plain view, which is probably the only way that they could really have pressed the, these issues in plain view was a, a firearm and some drug paraphernalia and some drugs. So inside the house were four people, two of them were Nathaniel Jackson and Ramon Ryan's. The two other were local people, a, a guy and a girl. <sighs> this is going to get a little uh, complicated. As far as I know, Keeley was involved with Nathaniel Jackson at, at one point. Um, eventually, uh, Ryan's leaves uh, a town, and he goes down to Burlington and sets up camp down there in public housing with a girl named Legia Collins. Legia is selling crack for him, and... She goes to a home, and she knows the woman in the home, knows the man in the home. The woman decides she's going to steal her crack and her money, so she hits her over the head with a baseball bat, and throws her down some cellar stairs, and kills her. She gets her boyfriend and another man named Timothy Cruz. His boyfriend's name is Moses Robar. Uh, the friend's name is Timothy Cruz, who had been released from prison for murder. And they take Legia Collins and they take her up to, a, uh, I believe, to a nature preserve and they leave her out in a wooded area. Ramon Ryans goes and, and, and reports Legia missing. Police go looking into it. They're on to Ellen almost immediately. She didn't go to work the next day. They knew that that's where she had been. Uh, they pull her in. They go to talk to, they pull over Moses Robar to talk to him. He, he pulls over on the side of the road and shoots himself. What, in front of the, in front of the police? Yeah, he just pulls over, puts a gun in his mouth and shoots himself. Alan ends up going to prison for the death of Legia. And that's a whole big sad story also. You know, I spoke to, I spoke to Legia's mother and oddly the way that they found Legia was her stepfather just went looking for her. He just went looking and wasn't going to stop, and he stumbled upon her. That was the story that I was told. But anyway, uh, fast forward, and Ellen Ducharme, who never goes to trial, there's proceedings and there's records of the proceedings and things like that. But she she never goes to trial. She pleads. She's still in prison. Um, she has a sister named Debbie Gordon. Police go to Debbie Gordon's at one point, and they're going to arrest her son on some petty warrant. And she starts screaming at the police officers, if you take my son, I won't tell you what happened to Brianna Maitland. Now, you're talking about an hour, or more than an hour away from where Brianna went missing. Brianna has no, absolutely no ties to Burlington. She doesn't have friends there. She doesn't have family there. Her only tie to that area would be Ramon Ryan's. The officer takes her side, records it, and she gives a sworn affidavit, which is the affidavit that is talked about and the show disappeared. And she tells off the cuff in front of this officer about a girl who's, you know, she's high profile, so she would have heard Brianna's name before probably. She has nothing to do with her. Tells this horrific detailed story of murder. In that her sister, Ellen Ducharme, Moses Robar, and Ramon Ryans were involved. Albeit, you have to understand that Debbie, from what I understand, is not trustworthy. She's nuts, for lack of better words. But it's interesting, nonetheless, how she would, after a, a good span of time, come up with this 
just like that, out of nowhere, and tell a horrific story that's really detailed, and what happened to her, and people's reaction to it when they were there, and it was happening, and the whole nine yards. When you say really detailed, do you are you referring to details that that are facts, or she just was very detailed in her storytelling? Yeah, this is the statement she gave. She gives a statement of her being put through a wood chipper and her head being removed and you know where it happened, not where it happened specifically, that it happened on a farm that Moses had worked on and all this other stuff. I mean, it gets really detailed, but it's, it's sickening to read. But the thing that I'm fascinated with with that is, and, you know, if you talk to the police, I think the majority will tell you she, she's just nuts. But I just think it's fascinating that, you know, a couple of years have gone by and it's an hour away, more than an hour away. And someone shows up at this woman's house, is going to pick up her kid on some stupid warrant. She loses her mind and tells us really detailed stories to the cop, lets him tape record it and gives us a, a statement. And were there any details that the police heard from her that they knew weren't something that she might have read in a newspaper or something? I don't know. You know, the, the most I ever got out of them about that, and I didn't really want to push it because, again, you know, they just they don't discuss things like that with a private yeah. investigator. They, it's not, you know, accepted. But I can tell you they don't believe it. They don't, be, they, they don't believe it. They don't believe, believe there's any way to confirm any of it. What about Bruce and Kelly? I think it's another situation if they don't know what to think. I mean, if you look at if you look at Fred and Maura's situation, he's just lost for words. He doesn't he, he doesn't know. He doesn't know anything more than he knew probably the first week. I don't think he I don't think he has an idea of where to turn left or right. In Brianna's case, the only thing that's kind of keeps you a little inspired is the fact that we believe that there are some local people there that we think there's a group of them that we know about that know what happened and that they just won't talk about it. What do you think it will take to get one of these people to talk? Is this being recorded? Yeah. I think that that's a house of cards. I think that there's, if one does, the rest will. I think there's at least three people that know what's going on with what happened. I'm not so sure that Ryan's and Jackson, who were made the, you know, kind of the center of that show, I'm not so sure they have anything to do with it at all. You know, um, there's there's been another group that, that everybody's kind of looked at. So, I don't know. I think if one falls, they, the rest will. And it gets, it gets far more involved and far more interesting. There's just so many weird twists and turns in this story. It's it's unbelievable. I, I can't even believe these parents have had to go through all of this, and it just gets more and more and more bizarre. So he says at least three people, and we heard from Tarek it was 10 to 15 that might know about this, but then Greg says... They're not even 100% sure that these are the right people at all. So what do you guys make of it? In my head, I'm seeing I'm seeing like two circles. Yes, Tarek said that there might be 10 to 15 people, right? And Greg Overacker is, you know, three or four, might have a couple on the peripheral, right? But there's like those three or four might be intersecting with those uh, 10 to 15 because Tarek said that, you know, not there weren't 10 to 15 people that did what they did to Brianna, but... They're in the entirety of the 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 crime, her disappearance, a cover up. There could be ten to fifteen people involved in the knowledge of what happened to her. The conspiracy of silence. Exactly. To me, I see that there is a consensus between these these two um, investigators in just the general crime and what happened to her, but. They have differing opinions about who knows about it and who's participating in the conspiracy of silence. In an area that you just let us know has a has a very low crime rate that has been recorded. So either either the the crime rate is 
at a normal to high level and it's just not recorded the violent crime rate or it actually does have a have a low you know recorded violent crime rate so the pressure that needs to be put on a, a very select group of people should be put on a select this select group of people i'm fully i'm fully in the corner of someone's going to crack yeah i think that's our best bet here is is hoping for that and trying to work towards uh, helping that happen. But I will say uh, that I'm not so sure Tarek and Greg are on the same page as who they think actually did this. I, I don't even know that that Greg has like a, a solid theory. I know he's got a lot of ideas, but based on that last clip, I'm not sure that he's got a solid theory. He's still, obviously he's an investigator, so he's looking at a lot of things. But it seems like the state police don't really hold what Tarek and Greg believe in the highest of regards because Tarek seemed to think they weren't that inter interested in what he had to say and Greg seemed to think so as well. Uh, uh, Greg said they just dismissed the woman as crazy so they might not take that account, the one that Greg and Tarek take as gospel or, or at least as Tarek takes as gospel they might not take that seriously at all. So what do we, and then we have Mark Harper. So we have four different, we, we have a crossroads here. Sure, but I think that even though Tarek has specific people in mind, right? And Greg Overacker has uh, a concept in mind, right? That there are people that may or may not be involved, but he hasn't, he hasn't uh, pinpointed or identified exactly who, I think that those people probably are within Tarek's circle. Right. Once if if Tarek if Tarek and and Greg were to sit down and, and go through it bullet point by bullet point, I think they'd find out that within Tarek's ten to fifteen people are overackers three to four people, and 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 then you, you you can really hone in on that. As far as the as far as the the, the police not taking it seriously. I'm interested to hear the the take on how 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 do you as a law enforcement agent dismiss somebody as oh she's crazy? How, it, it, I mean maybe I mean this is all hearsay of course you know this True. is yeah. this is Greg Overacker saying you know they just said she's crazy. How do you where do you where do you where do you make that distinction between this is crazy or but a crazy person can do crazy things too and see crazy shit so. Where do you make that distinction? In any um, unsolved case, people are going to develop their own theories, um, law enforcement included, and then use their discretion to determine what accounts are and are not credible. And sometimes they can warp their sense of reality to fit that theory that they've already formed in their head, sort of like a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I think that when when a law enforcement official writes someone off so callously like oh she's just crazy it's probably because it could be because what she's saying just doesn't align with his mentality toward the case or it it could mean that she just isn't a reliable witness and that they're in that law enforcement's trained in seeing who in who isn't reliable i would hope it's not the case where it's infuriating to me that law enforcement who's trained for this officially like formally trained in this would, would be that dismissive. I hope that's not the case. I, I really hope not to. And maybe I'm, maybe I'm just pessimistic, but I think that um, we've seen in many cases that initial theory is developed and then they work with that theory and it seems like the one and true theory. Um, in both disappearances of Brianna, Maitland, and Moore Murray, Law enforcement were convinced at first that it was a voluntary disappearance, that um, both were instances of drug drivers who left their cars and would just come back and then both thought that they ran away because of things that they were doing in their lives. But now both agencies think that the most likely scenario is foul play. So it's just, it's interesting how, just considering how the stubbornness of staying in your own theory might have limited these investigations human nature is 
to choose the easiest path. So if you're a police officer, you're going to hope that this car left here was not uh, the victim of a murder. It was just a drunk driver. So you're going to hope and assume that uh, because you don't have evidence so far to go any further than that. So it, it's just like any other, every other job, every job that the listeners have, every job that we have, we're going to take the easiest path. I'm coming in. I'm going to come in hot on this Please, one. Please, <laughs> blow, blow me away. I strongly disagree. If you've taken the job in law enforcement, you have decided that you are not following the easiest path. You are not part of human nature. You are not part of that natural human nature. You, right. you do not say the easiest path is this. You say, what are the paths? Okay, well, that's all well and good if you're a year out of police academy. But, you know, 10 years in, five, five years in, you're really going to have that same fire? No. People definitely fall into their patterns. And I think that people are really prideful. And, I mean, we see it with armchair sleuths, how they, they have their theory and then they stick to it and... They just count the things that discredit the theory and they um, elevate the significance of things that do match their theory. And I think that um, law enforcement is often put on a pedestal like they're, I guess, above human error and above pride and things like that. But I do think those things get in the way. And even if I'm completely wrong here, it's it's still a case that hasn't been solved for 13 years. So something, something went wrong there. Right. Human error is a part of police job it's it's part of every job and i agree with you lance it shouldn't be part of law enforcement's job but that is just human nature no you said human you just said human error yeah error is part of everything yeah human error is part of everything the 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 human nature of choosing the the easiest path yeah well that's an error yeah and i still disagree with like it's not I don't think anybody. I, I don't think anybody that that has some drive in them chooses the easiest path. I don't think and it's like a you, conscious it, decision. I think it's more of like exactly. like an unconscious, like what makes the most sense, like what is the most. Cause I mean, what ends up being true a lot of the time is that the most simple explanation is the explanation. So I think that people unconsciously kind of make these cognitive shortcuts to make sense of things, even if it's not the most reflective of reality. All things being equal. Your, your solution is the most obvious, it's the most obvious solution, right? That's, that's the full, that's the full concept. If all things are equal, it's the, if all things are equal and these are not, all things are not equal in these situations. So we should just, we need to throw that right out because you don't look at, you need to look at these, this, this, the circumstances are not aligned. Nothing's equal here. You find a car on the side of the road, though, you're law enforcement. You've seen it before. Uh, kids run into the woods. They run off. They abandon their car for a night, so they don't get a DUI. That's the most likely scenario for a car that's left on the side of the road. And we heard how small their police force is. Um, this is they're not used to crimes of this nature. They're not going to jump to that conclusion. And then when they realize that something more sinister may have taken place, it's it's shameful to go back and see that you were jumping to conclusions that you were wrong. And they're sorry about it. And they've admitted their mistakes. I understand that they're sorry. Yeah, I understand that they're sorry. But I'm not, I, I don't expect them to look at that car and say, foul play. You know what I expect them to do? Run the fucking registration and contact the mother and say, do you know your car was backed into a barn? And they never did that. And we have two cases that have been going on for 13 years where a the better part of those cases have been police backtracking and police trying to cover up mistakes that they made because they were lazy. And I'm a fan of law enforcement, but when you're lazy because you're, you just, it's cold or someone might've ran into the woods, you're not doing your job. I mean, like we said, they didn't take pictures. They, they didn't run the, they didn't run the plates, um, figure out that the primary driver was 17 and see that something was wrong, you know? My overall point is, and I, and, I, and I hate being the person who's like, well, something's wrong, so we got to figure out like whose fault it is, because it doesn't help you when you're trying to figure out how to solve what's wrong, right? So we know, we, we, we know how we got to where we got now, but can we just get through the bullshit with, 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 with the, the, the backtracking and just, and, and I don't want to say like the covering up, but can we just get through the fact that, yeah, we made some mistakes, and you said it, Tim, yeah, they are sorry. 
they they said it they, they they've come out and said it publicly that they made mistakes they handled this incorrectly from the very beginning we're not trying to be hard on them where you know that this is an like you said lance this is an oath they took um and and people expect perfection from them but we we've, we've said here or at least i have that i you know it's not possible and often small communities like that are not are simply just not equipped to investigate more intense criminal activity they're equipped to in, run the registration on a car that's backed into a barn so thank you very much for listening to episode one of crawl space on the disappearance of brianna maitland we will be back in two weeks with more of this kind of episode and look for the singular interviews we did in their entirety posted on the same feed follow us on twitter at crawl space pod or on instagram facebook as well if you have any thing you'd like to say to us please email us at crawlspacepodcast at gmail.com Thank you.